Hi everyone, it's Kirk and Michael for this week's edition of The Rundown. Michael, there's been a little delay here. We've got a lot of things going on. A little delay. We had, you know, it's been a while. the craziness of year end for 2023, the equally craziness for the year beginning of 2024. Always crazy in January. And now we are finally getting some time to record again. So, and truth be told, we, we've recorded, this is, a, this is like the third attempt at this. Yeah, this is a re, re-record. It is. So, we're going to attempt today to have a discussion around bonds. And we just want to give you an idea, a sense of, of how, the basics on bonds, but how we're utilizing bonds within people's plans. Mm-hmm. And what are the things we should be focused on and not focused on. And some of the things that the buzzwords the industry tends to focus on that maybe aren't as important for most of our clients. Which, you know, the buzzwords, and we'll talk about that in the they say, is what triggered really us to move this topic up the list to, ha- to have the, dis- the discussion today as opposed to later on in the year. It is because we have a number of things that are really high priority. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, there's some great shows coming up I mean, yeah. in, our, in, in, the, in our list. Um, I know you've already started working on outlines for the next couple. Mm-hmm. I, I'm super excited. I think everyone's going to like. But today, bonds. Let's focus on bonds. So, yep. so Michael, I know in our class we spend a lot of time um, explaining key metrics, um, key data points to focus on to understand what kind of bonds that the people attending our class own. Mm-hmm. We teach them about credit quality in the class. We teach them about uh, average maturities, not just a maturity, but the average maturity of the portfolio. We teach about average yield of the portfolio. We teach around duration, right? Which is very nuanced and um, probably not appropriate for today's uh, discussion. People want to understand that again, they're more than welcome to go back through a class where we drill in down on this. Mm-hmm. But Michael, let's, let's focus on the things that are applicable to people in our private practice or the things that we're using um, for our clients in our practice to execute often pivot accounts for our, I mean, we're, we're using bonds in many cases as pivot accounts so that people can have these larger withdrawal rates, these six, seven, eight percent withdrawal rates because of these pivot accounts. So I think there's a lot of curiosity around bonds. Yeah, and so before we can dive into how we use them in the plans, I think it's safe, where we, I think we should start with sort of how bonds, what bonds have experienced over the past, you know, 30, 40 years and how they work in conjunction with the market. I think you're right. I so think you're right. without diving too deeply into the weeds, a really simple takeaway for bonds is that the price of bonds is inversely correlated with yields. When yields are falling, bond prices go up. When yields are rising, bond prices go down. I think people get confused on this, Michael, because like if someone hears you say interest rates are falling, the assumption, some people have the assumption that means my bonds are losing money, but no, 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 no. If you already own a bond today Mm -hmm. and yields are falling, that means the bond that you have is paying a higher yield, it makes your bond worth more money. Exactly. And vice versa, right? So if I have a really low paying yielding bond and interest rates rise, that means the one that I own isn't as valuable because someone could buy a newer bond that's going to pay me more yield to own it. Does that make sense? 100%. Sorry to interrupt your regularly scheduled rundown, but there is an important point we wanted to make and we missed. So we're cutting this in because this is applicable to many of our clients and it's a common question we get. The question is, that we often get from clients, is why does my bond say that I'm only yielding a half of a percent or 1% or 2%? So. The confusion is people think that's all the money you're making. So why does my bond say that I'm only yielding 1%? And the reason, there's several reasons we do this, but here's how a simple example of how it works. I will buy your bond at what we call a discount. So let's say I buy the bond at 95. When the bond matures in one year and one day, 
later, it's going to mature and I'm going to get 100 back. So I paid 95 and I will get 100 back. Plus the 1% yield the coupon makes. In that example, we have a total yield of approximately 6%-ish. The advantages are the difference between my purchase price and the maturity price is treated as capital gains taxes and the coupon, the yield, the coupon on the bond is treated as ordinary income. So there's tax favorability and tax advantages to doing, that way, do it, doing it that way as well as, as some others. But we wanted to make sure you understood because there is some confusion around that. I hope that was helpful. Now back to our regularly scheduled program. In, in, uh, one more thing, Michael, and I'll let you go. There's two drivers of what creates value in one's bond that they own. One is yield, and one is your purchase price. I don't want to get too far in the weeds. But it is really important to know that all of your bonds, when they mature, will mature at 100, at par. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's par. So, so the price of value of your bonds will go up and down from 100. It goes down or goes up from 100. That's how it works. And your yield pays you a coupon. So there's two levers that drive performance with bonds. Is that helpful? I hope, or did that create confusion? Price and yield, and we'll tackle that more yes. later on today. Okay, yep. sorry. Jump so we have here a uh, 30, 40 year chart of the 10 year yield for US treasuries. Yeah. And so from 1982 all the way down through 2020, there is one long term, very obvious theme. The 10 year treasury yields and all bond yields, this is just one example, were falling from the early 80s through 2020. This was the greatest bull run in bond history because bond prices fell from, or bond, sorry, bond yields fell from 16-ish percent down to you know, a half, half of a, a percent. A half of a percent. Was. Yes, that was the low. And so as yields are falling, 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 bond prices were rising, 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 rising. Right, for those who own the bonds that are paying higher as the yields were falling, their values were going up. It was the greatest 30 year run. 30, 40 year. Almost 40 year run. I mean, in the history of the stock market, you never made more money in bonds. And that is why for so long, people heard about and relied on the 60, 40 portfolio, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. It was really, really easy because that 40% bond slice was really benefiting from these yields falling. Michael, fa f frankly, it's the, it was the, it was the origination of the 4% rule too. Yeah, the 60-40 right? portfolio, the 4% rule, all those rules of thumb. Because yields were falling and bond values were rising. Right. So it, was, it, was, it was really glorious for 60-40 portfolios. And then all of a sudden 2020 comes along and we get down to 0.5%, uh, you know, COVID hits, all the world sort of changes, and then bond yields start to increase. Rapid, rapidly. rapidly. And that is, you know, on this 40 year chart here, that bounce from 2020 up until present day doesn't look like a significant change, but you need to understand going from, uh, from four to 0.5, it's a three and a half percent drop, but it's an eight times difference. Yeah. So and then going from 0.5 to five is a four and a half percent increase, but it's a 10 times increase. Well, I think this is where people maybe f don't fully appreciate the movement in, in the shock to the system, honestly, mm -hmm. f having interest rates rise as quickly as they do. Because I think a lot of people look at just the total yields. Well, it was only a four and a half percent increase in yield, but, but, but you have to appreciate the difference between 3% to, to, to uh, or uh, better yet, the difference, no, that's fine. The difference between 3% to 6% is a 3% increase, mm -hmm. but it's only a 2x right. increase. A half of a percent to 5% 
is a 10x increase. So that was that 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 is the, the severity of what we were dealing with, not the total yield, but the 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 how many times increase we experienced. the multiple. The, thank you. Gosh, exactly. The and so really, so what does that mean for bond prices and bond returns? So the next chart here shows uh, roughly you know 45 ish years of historical bond returns. This yeah. is the bond index. And you'll see, so the, um, we've gone through this chart a bunch of times, but again, the gray bar is the annual return for the year. The red dot below that is the largest intra-year drawdown the index went through throughout the year. So for example, I'll, I'll pick a random year here. So in, I'll pick the very first one. In 76, the far left bar, the total return for the bond index that year was 16%. And throughout the year, the worst drawdown the index experienced was a negative 1% drawdown. Right. Of a fairly calm, very positive year for bonds. So what's a pretty obvious takeaway from the chart is from 76 through 2012-ish, 2013-ish, there are very mild drawdowns. The, yeah. the red dots are negative two, negative three, negative four on average, and pretty positive gray bars. Roaring. Because bonds that's when roaring. bonds were roaring, that's when the yields were falling, falling, falling. Yes. And then all of a sudden, what jumps off the page, I hope to people, is that really ugly 2022 bar. And again, we talked about this back in 2022. I'm still not sure people understand the severity of that bond crash in 2022. I think, I think our clients in our private practice, so if people watching the rundowns in our private practice, they may not appreciate, but those people who are watching on our charities website, the general public, have a pretty good understanding because there was no place for people to hide in, their, fair. in their 401ks. The average 401k in 2022 was down 23%. And the reason it was, and if you were to do it yourself, or probably 28% because you had a growth deal. Mm -hmm. But the reason why is even those people who try to buoy their, uh, their portfolios to have some, some bond exposure got crushed. I mean, the 60-40 portfolio on average lost about 18% in 2022. Mm -hmm. So there was no place like So those people felt it. People in our private practice know we've used, we were using, for, in many cases, alternatives for bonds, not discussion for today, but alternatives for bonds. Some of their insured accounts were the pivot accounts to give them that protection and that sequence of returns management. Right, which is why, you know, in the class, we have people ask us, well, I've always read bonds offset stock risk. And, you know, when rates are at 15%, like they were back in the early 80s and falling, <laughs> sure. But when rates are at, you know, 0.5%, that was not going to work. And, well, Michael, and it didn't. I, and I don't, I don't have the numbers. Maybe we have a chart for it. I, I actually, I don't think we do have a chart, but maybe you have an idea and you can estimate, ballpark it. From 2016 through 22, the 10 year was on average where? Two ish? Well, we can, uh, it's, it's, yeah, two ish. Two ish percent? Estimate. Yeah. So that was the yield on a, a 10 year treasury, which is was 4% historical norms. Mm -hmm. The historical norm is around 6% on a 10 year treasury. So it's one of the reasons why anyone that came to our classes in 2015 16 recognized we started to pivot a little bit away from the bonds and our clients in our private practice now we've pivoted back into bonds since yields have come up because mm -hmm. now the risk reward is better but we were screaming about this correlation risk this interest rate risk duration duration risk for years in our class and I think we saved I mean, we've taught 10,000 people Michael I just if a few percent of them listen to us <laughs> we saved a lot of people's retirements and so we, st we start with all this just to give people a sense of how do bonds get used in plans. Yes. And this basis hopefully gives people under an understanding of, okay, interest rates up, bond prices down, and vice versa. Okay, great, got that. So what does that mean for my plan? Well, okay, so one more thing I want to, before we even go to the plan, I know we're, we're already getting along, but I think <laughs> what, what, what's... I said something and it, and it triggered me that we should probably discuss a little bit more about is the risk reward 
I mean, why in 2018, 19, 20, were we not using as many bonds for our, uh, uh, in our portfolios, the risk reward, and why are we doing it now? Mm -hmm. Because when interest rates are higher as they are now, let's say the 10 year treasuries, call it around 4%. We yep. get five at its all time high. Oh, uh, not all time high. <laughs> That's high. The most recent, recent high, high yep. was five, but we're at about four right now. So that means even if interest rates rally up and our bond prices do fall, which on average on a 10 year treasury for every 1% interest rates go up, your bond that your 10 year treasury bond that you own will go down about 10%. We are earning 4% per year interest to offset some of that interest rate sensitivity. Mm -hmm. When you're only earning 1%, you have no margin for error. Right. So the risk reward is a little better for us. Does that make sense? It's a lot better. It's not. Well, when you're starting from a higher base, a higher. It's better. When you're starting from a higher base, that duration risk is not nearly as sensitive. Correct. And so that's one of the reasons, although, frankly, and we'll talk about how we're using them, we're still being relatively short in our duration. We're mm -hmm. not getting too far out, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, I mean, 30 year treasuries got cut more than half. They were down from peak to trough. 30 year treasuries were, were during that period where, where yields went from 0.5 to 5. Yeah. 30 year treasuries fell 55 ish percent. Just unbelievable. Crazy. Craziness. So anyways, all right. So let's talk about um, how we're using them in, uh, in, in our planning philosophies. Yeah. So we've talked about, you know, the green zone, the yellow zone, the red zone, buckets within buckets to death. If that's a new concept to you, you can search in the, the rundown page. You can search buckets within buckets. You'll find that video, really important video if you haven't seen it yet. So the bonds are really important to the red zone bucket, the short term safety zone bucket. And really, there are two main ways that we will use bonds in that red zone bucket. It is either bond ETFs or individual bonds, not bond funds. If that's news to you, go to the class. Yes. No, no one. We don't use bond funds ever mm -hmm. in anything. So to elaborate, Michael, in that um, uh, red zone, um, we're using, and it really depends on tax qualifications, whether it's an IRA or a non-qualified account, we can use one of three things. There are going to be uh, actually four things. Individual muni municipal bonds, we'll talk about why and when. Individual corporate bonds, um, individual treasury bonds, or ETFs bonds bonds within an ETF. If you mm -hmm. don't know that or understand that, again, go to the class. We specifically talk about that. Yep. Uh, like the ag is a great example. So, so, so how, where do you want to go from there? Because I don't want to go, I could spend an hour talking about this. <laughs> I know you could. Everyone knows you could. So, He's cute. why don't we talk about, some people say, well, you guys say, you, you talk about bonds and some, some of my accounts have individual bonds. Some have bond ETFs. Mm. Why? What, why would you pick one versus the other? What causes that? So, all right. So one is going to be uh, uh, when I need to use them will be a factor. The la larger factor is the total amount of dollars I can allocate to fixed income. Mm -hmm. um, so we're never going to buy, I shouldn't say never, it occasionally happens, but Generally speaking, general rule of thumb, we're not buying a treasury for less than $50,000. Mm -hmm. We're not buying a corporate bond or a muni bond usually for less than $20,000, $25,000 for a lot of reasons we won't discuss today. And I won't just buy three or four munis or three or four corporate bonds typically. I'm going to buy. So, so now you get an appreciation for the amount of dollars I need to be able to build a corporate bond portfolio. An individual corporate bond portfolio. Individual corporate bond portfolio. So usually $150,000 is the minimum I would need to just put in an individual corporate bond portfolio. Mm -hmm. Usually around 250000 to 250000 usually two fifty, in a municipal, individual municipal bond portfolio. And treasury, we're going to $50,000 minimum. Everything else is going to go into a bond ETF. Good? 
that's the, so that first distinction is size. If if it's a hundred thousand dollar, if it's a forty-five thousand dollar, somewhere one fifty or less, it typically goes into ETFs yes. because there's less size restrictions and they're more liquid. More liquidity. Yeah. Now this this goes back to and we talked about this before we recorded how the plan structure drives the investments it's really versus important. we try to explain to people and I think most people who come to our private practice from other firms recognize this, but people who are do-it-yourself first before coming to see us don't quite recognize this as much. A, a typical firm will, will focus on the investment strategy and then they take that investment strategy and they spread it to all their clients. As I'm glad you point this out, Michael, and, I, and I'll let you keep going, but I want to elaborate on that because it's a really important distinction. Most firms have a philosophy and they follow from an investment perspective, an investment philosophy, and then everyone that comes in is going to somehow fit into their investment philosophy. There's a lot of reasons they do that. One, it's their core competency. Two, it's um, scalability. Profitability, scalability, and efficiencies, mm -hmm. right? Michael, and we've talked about this until we're blue in the face, and I think in our next episode, we're gonna elaborate even further on this. Every one of your plans dictates what you own, not what our strategies dictates your plans. It's the opposite. So what you own is gonna be driven by what your plan tells us you need to own. And how do we know? Well, it's when do I need the dollars? How aggressive is the spend down, right? What percentage withdrawal mm -hmm. rates are we taking? How much insured income do we have after 75 years old, right? There are risk mitigation factors that we're looking at, which we're gonna do a rundown specifically on that, because we think we have a better way to communicate some of the risk mitigation techniques we're using, why we're able to take such aggressive grow, uh, uh, spend downs. Right. So, so the bonds, are, and what you own and when you own is going to be driven by your plan. And every plan is different. And that is, again, totally opposite from the industry. The industry, they spend their time on the investments. They take those answers and they shove it into all their clients' portfolios. And that's much, much Easy. faster, easier, <laughs> more scalable. And, I mean, people who have been through the process have a plan. And I've told everyone who I'm meeting with, your plan drives everything. Your plan okay. drives the bucket allocation, your plan drives the investments. To that point, part of what Kirk's doing every single day is looking at the plans and, the, and based on what that plan is calling for, allocating the dollars. And that's what, what takes hours and hours and hours and hours of your day. We're, and we're gonna elaborate a little more on how that looks, the mechanics of that when we talk about uh, performance. Mm -hmm. That's all I had to do. I'll have everyone <laughs> performance. And we're going to talk about that next uh, next episode. One thing I think before we move, and I know you've got more stuff, but I want to make sure we we clarify around our, our bonds. So if you're right now today, if you're owning an individual corporate bond, individual municipal bonds, and or individual treasuries, there is some sort of laddering going on. So do you want to really quickly just give them an explanation of what we're laddering? And in our ladders right now, we're laddering out four years max, maybe occasionally five years. And so this is the case when a plan tells us that they need a certain amount of income in a certain amount of time over the next three, four years. When do I need the money? And it makes sense to use individual bonds versus ETFs because when you own the individual bonds, when the bonds mature, you're going to get that par value back. Yes. As long as the, the company doesn't, if it's a corporate or the, municipal, the municipality does not go bankrupt. Yeah, assuming no defaults. Assuming no defaults, you're going to get that money back in time for the plan to send you the income. So again, the plan is driving ETFs versus individual bonds. So Michael, this is a good point. I think, let's spend a minute, just a minute on it because so what we're buying is driven by when you're going to need the dollars in those first four years being the most critical sequence of returns risk. So there's a lot of mechanics to this too. So a ladder would be I'm buying uh, bonds 
that will mature in one year, then more bonds that will mature in two years, and then more bonds that will mature in three years, and then more bonds that will mature in four years. And then when they mature, what some firms will typically do is just roll them back in mm -hmm. and purchase another set of bonds. Set of bonds, and they'll just keep rolling the the rolling and rolling. We don't. We're not rolling. We are making sure whatever you need for income, a large percentage of your income, is maturing the year that you need the income. Mm -hmm. So ladders have to be timed, and they're not always perfect on timing because I want to find you the best yield and the best returns. So they could be months off, right, of when you need the dollars. So then I have to have an account for the money just to fall into. That's where the Dorsey account comes, which is where we distribute the income from. Mm -hmm. So there's so many mechanics around getting you your income in these bonds and their maturity dates. It's, it's nuanced. This is why most people just <clears throat> use a bond fund. Because it's always yes. liquid and they can just sell, raise funds and send you income. And I'm guessing... But we have multiple more accounts that we have to have and systematic withdrawal plans from accounts to get you your income the way we're doing it. And I'm guessing there are probably a decent percentage of people who that comment just flew over their heads. And that's okay. It's okay. The bottom line is everything in the plan has a job, has a purpose, has a role. And we are not willy-nilly assigning individual bonds, ETFs, munis, corporates, <laughs> treasuries. Nothing is an accident. It is yeah. based very intentionally on when your plan needs income. It is. And last thing, because we really focused on ladders, we didn't really spend a lot of time talking about why we would also use bond ETFs. Mm -hmm. And so there's that uh, intermediate time. What color is that zone, Michael? Yellow zone. Thank you. The yellow zone where we're going to need income or money for your plan within you know three to eight or four to nine years that area where we're going to have 60 percent in equities or 70 percent in equity stocks etfs and then 30 40 percent will be in a bond etf sometimes we'll use individual bonds but sometimes a bond etf mm -hmm. again liquidity is important because Theoretically, what, we're, what we'll get into when we're going to rebalance. We don't just rebalance like everybody else. We rebalance based upon market conditions strategically, and that's going to be the next show, which is going to be super fun to teach people how we're driving performance. Yes. All right. I keep teasing that. I, I'm excited. It'll for be it. a really good show. I'm excited for it. I think it'll change everyone's perspective a little bit about the nuance of what we're doing. So. All right, so let's jump into they say, and this is a good one because this really is, you know, the buzzwords around bonds right now, the tax-free, This is uni, what prompted the show. Exactly. Yeah. So, so, Michael, I think what drives, one of the easiest things to sell, the easiest thing to sell in our industry, especially right now, is anything related to tax efficiency, tax-free, tax planning, mm -hmm. which makes this investment that people are purchasing right now just about the easiest thing to sell and we don't i mean we use them we we use them regularly we use them when they should be used but based on the plan that's not it. just oh it's tax free that must be the right answer well let's put this in perspective our practice is a high net worth sort of family office right mm -hmm. even with that i'm still using this a small percentage of the time and so th one of the easiest things to sell is tax-free munis. And this really is a trend that all of our advisors are seeing. Michael, you're seeing it regularly. People yeah. coming in with tax-free muni portfolios. And they're in like a, you know, 22% bracket, sometimes 24, maybe. I've seen a handful in 12% tax brackets. brackets. It's like they sold you something because it's tax-free and everyone assumes, oh, if it's tax-free, doesn't everyone want tax-free? Yes, tax-free is great. But at the end of the day, it's what gives you the greatest amount of money in your pocket mm -hmm. after all sources of income. Not just one, not in a vacuum, all sources of income. So what gives us the greatest amount of income in our pockets? So when you're looking at tax-free munis, the question isn't, oh great, it's tax-free, but what is my yield? What am I making? with my tax-free bond compared to a taxable bond, and then I have to pay tax on it after my taxes, what have I made? 
Right. My net after tax yield, right? Exactly. And so, you know, we have two screenshots here that compare a... I was pretty animated there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, go ahead. That compare a corporate taxable portfolio yes. versus a municipal tax-free bond portfolio to show the, te the, the yield differences and how people can get tricked by this. So the corporate taxable yield portfolio, it's a five-year corporate bond portfolio. It's yielding approximately... No, 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 no. It's a four-year ladder. Sorry to interrupt. It's a four-year ladder. It's a four-year ladder that is has a uh, yield of 5.14%. Oh, thank you. Average yes. yield. Yep. It's a four, sorry, it's, it's confusing the way I, I printed this. No, you're good. So yes, you're correct. Four-year ladder yielding an average of 5.14%. Now that's taxable 5.14%. You have to pay taxes yes. on that 5.14%. Yes, so what's your, what's your effective tax rate, which we teach in the class, but let's say your t effective tax rate is 10%. Mm -hmm. So you're, ye after paying taxes, you're making about 4.5% on that. Is that fair? That's fair. And some people who have not been to the class might roll their eyes and say, yeah, right, I'll never be in a 10% effective rate. It's not... You're in a 22% bracket if you're in an effective 10%. Right. Go ahead. And so let's compare that to a tax-free municipal bond portfolio. So here it's a very similar layout of a screenshot here. And this is showing the four-year ladder, ladder yep. of the muni bond portfolio is yielding a tax-free yield of approximately 2.74%. Yep. So people, when, they're, when an advisor or when they're doing research on their own and they find a tax-free muni portfolio and they see the words tax-free, they go bananas and they want it. Yes, tax-free, give it to me. But you're getting 2.74% tax-free. If you're in that 10-ish percent effective... Well, we took an example. This is a married filing joint person with $125,000 of taxable income, right? For them, you see, you see the line below, the tax equivalent yield is 3.92%. So these people would be much better off with the taxable corporate portfolio yield. The 5.14%. As opposed to the tax-free muni, which has a tax equivalent yield of 3.92%. Right. But th people in these situations get tricked by the industry, by their research, by the buzzwords, by the words tax-free. I see the commercials all the time. Buy tax-free bonds. They're tax-free. Well, okay, gr that's great. But what is my after-tax yield? What am I making? And I have to compare apples to apples. And we don't want to just focus on just the bonds, how it impacts all of your other assets too. Tax-free munis are also taxable against your Social Security, so you have to add back Social Security. There's some nuance to this. And that's, there's a lot of nuance that we do cover that in the class also. We do. So that's the say, I hope it's helpful because we're seeing a lot of people coming through our class buying tax-free munis when they have no business. I mean, it's a small percentage of our clients that have tax-free munis that most people, million, two, three, four, five million, still don't need and shouldn't own tax-free munis often. And that's, you know, on the account review questionnaires, we'll get questions of, my friends own munis and I don't. Why are you missing this? Yes. We're not missing it. We're we not. ran the analysis and the plan tells us that you'd be worse off with munis. Yes. So tell your friends to stop buying sizzle and have a plan built. I Come to the class. I like a little animated there. <laughs> it's, it is you. very frustrating when people think they found something that we missed and it's, nope, we ran that analysis <laughs> and uh, trust us, we ran that analysis and it does not make sense for you. Great. Is there any homework? Uh, no homework running long, and we'll see you next couple weeks ish Yeah, in here. a couple weeks. We're going to try to turn this quicker this time so we can for get back For a really after. exciting run. Yes, please stick That I spent there. about 30 hours of research prep for. Yes, you did. <laughs> see you next time.